everyone. Welcome to the next installment of Insecurity. We are at episode 20, Those of for those of you who are counting. And today, we have a really serious problem that we need to address right now. And the problem is a single line of code that was indented properly, but improperly commented. So let's ask Tom Webster if he has any iOS devices. I do not, thankfully. Um, I don't have any iPads, any iPhones, any Macs, even any old Macs lying around. I have got no iOS devices at all. As a matter of fact, I have only got one Windows device in my home. So I'm probably out of the ordinary. Probably you must the have a pair of... Uh, you must have some white, white iPhone headphones lying around somewhere. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure there's tons just everywhere. They seem to reproduce. They're like rabbits. You leave two tangled pair of earbuds alone in a room for long enough, you'll end up with like 30 after a couple days. Now, which do you have more of? Micro USB cables or 30-pin dock connectors? <laughs> At work, we've got way too many 30-pin dock connectors. At home, I uh, actually found on Amazon that they had BlackBerry micro USB cables, and because they were BlackBerry branded, it's like, hey, you get 10 for a dollar. So, of course, I spent 10 bucks, and now they're everywhere. I've just got a box that I just pull cables out of. I found out that a USB connect, uh, cable can die. I plug my phone in, the and it didn't charge, and I'm like, what is going on? And I plug it into something else, and it starts charging. Apparently, these cables can go bad. Mm -hmm. It's just the worst. It's in the morning and you have 10% left. Yeah, I so I got off lucky, um, or at least I, I was very thankful. I fought with my old phone for a couple hours to, trying to figure out why it wouldn't charge. No matter what I did, like if I bent it a certain way, it would charge, and I thought it was the actual charging component in the phone. Instead, it ended up just being the cable. So I was very relieved and kind of annoyed with myself that I didn't try that sooner. Well, let's get back on track. Well, I have a Mac, a very old Mac. I have in my possession two iPad 2 LT or 3G at the time, so iPad 2s, and I think that's it. But at school, I run a lab of 24 new MacBook Airs and an iMac for myself. And obviously, I, I stopped everything Monday morning, and I told all my students, you must update. I did not... I mean, we, we barely got through the Pledge of Allegiance before I was up there updating. We brought the code out. We did everything. Every teacher I saw, iPhone, update. And I had to explain it. But yeah. but this problem is big, but I don't actually know exactly what the problem is. That's why I was hoping you can explain it. Yeah, and actually it relates quite perfectly to um, the uh, – I. I'm trying to find the number. Number 17, we talked about our podcast, number 17, not-so-free public Wi-Fi. Uh, and this ties in perfectly. So if you are on a shared network, if you are you know, on Wi-Fi and it's public and open or it's using WEP and you're sharing it with other people that you may or may not trust, then this bug is a serious vulnerability in the way the iPhone or Macs make a connection to a secure website. So what they do, they use a uh, technology called SSL or TLS. Um, what happens is the server and your computer talk for a little bit. It's highly technical the way they do it, but they talk for a little bit. And they ended up making a secure tunnel between the two endpoints. And then people in the middle, all they see is random static noise. It's encrypted data. They don't know what it is. They can't infer what it is. They have no idea. Unfortunately, what this bug does, the way SSL works is you check the certificate and you say, yeah, this was signed by someone we trust, someone that's known to give out certificates like VeriSign or Rapid SSL or a couple other different companies. There's a whole lot of different SSL providers. Um, so what happens is we check that, and then we make sure they've got the right key. They're using the right keys for their encryption. This bug makes it so you can use any key. It doesn't, it doesn't do one of the verifications for SSL. It allows anyone 
to use any key whatsoever to impersonate anyone else. Meaning, if you connect to Dropbox, if you connect to your bank, if you connect to Gmail or Outlook or anything else on a shared network, someone could be listening in on that traffic. Somebody could be the man in the middle. They could be looking at everything going across the wire and you aren't secured. And this bug affects Macs, it affects iPhones, it affects iPads, it affects all iDevices of any type unless you update it. So please, if you're listening to us, we this is recorded, go grab your iPhone, your iPad, your Mac, whatever, do the update immediately. There are do updates it now. available. Pause us. Yes. Pause us. We will be here. Now. We will be right here. Um, this is a serious vulnerability. And it's not so serious if you, you know, sit and use your cell connection only or if you use your home network's Wi-Fi and it's secured. It is a huge issue if you use any form of public Wi-Fi, which we discussed is a bad idea at, at the start, right? Um, but this also means, it, let's say you're using a VPN. Let's say you're on public Wi-Fi and you're just like, well, this doesn't matter. I'm using a VPN. Okay, does your VPN use SSL certificates for verification? Does it use SSL to make that connection? Depending on the VPN program you're using, if they go to iOS and they say, hey, make an SSL connection for me, yeah, guess what? Someone can listen to all of that traffic. The, connection, the, the tunnel gets created, but someone else could be in the middle listening to all the data, and you would never know. What's supposed to happen is the keys are checked and it goes, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. This isn't who he says he is. We're not going to connect. Instead, it doesn't ever do that check. So it connects to anyone, no matter what. I mean, that sounds bad. The good part is, and I have on my screen here, uh, we were lucky enough, and we'll link this in the show notes, to show you the actual code. And you don't need to be a genius in reading code, but you can see down there, you see two go-to fails. And it's just, it's a clear oversight that the, one of the developers made. Go to, if something fails, go to fail. But they left this extra one in, and I guess no one picked it up for at least two, uh, two revisions. And the problem is, this is so bad that Apple... Uh, patched it in iOS 6 and pushed that out as an update. And we all know Apple doesn't like to have what they what they call fragmentation. They don't want people on iOS 6 and iOS 7. They want everyone on iOS 7. But it was so bad that if you were on iOS 6, they would push the update. They would push the update without nagging you to move to iOS 7 so you can keep iOS 6 and still be safe. The good part is, I mean, if there's a silver lining here, it only affected iOS 6 and later devices. So if you had an original iPad 1, you're okay. If you had an ancient iPod Touch that you really only use for music, that's still okay. This is an iOS 6 and iOS 7 and I guess uh, uh, OS 10.8 or 9. Cur obviously the current one and the last one, but I don't know how much before that. Right. Um, and there's, we've got a, a new website. If you want to check, if you haven't run your updates yet, even though we told you to, there's a new website called, uh, it's just gotofail.com, G-O-T-O fail.com. What it'll do is it will allow you to test your device. Um, they've got a little test here. It says, you know, uh, this site will help you determine whether your computer is vulnerable to go to fail. You know, the horrible iPhone or horrible Apple iOS uh, OS 10 vulnerability. It'll show green or it'll show red. Um, you can go ahead and click a link to force the test if it shows you're safe just to make sure. Just to make sure you're safe. So for me, I ran it and it said, yeah, your browser aborted loading our test image and uh, you're safe. So go to fail.com will allow you to check this stuff and it's, it's a really easy website. You just go there and it works. Just by the way, if you're doing this on a Mac, Safari is a Safari is a problem. But if you're using another browser, Firefox, Opera, Chrome, you're okay. With that said, I have not. I mean, I've been busy. I have not sat at this Mac in the last day or two, except for now. So I have actually not updated yet. I'm going to do that later. But again, I'm not. On, I'm on secure Wi-Fi. I think I'm real. I'm really behind. A few routers and uh, what's it called? I'm using Chrome, so I will update, but we'll do it a little later. 
Yeah, and it's you know it's a relatively small update. If you're thinking, oh man, this is gonna be like that time updated to iOS seven, and it took me like twenty five minutes, and my phone just sat there and was updating and ran through everything. It took forever. No, no, it's not like that. This update is so super small. I mean, you saw the code right there. It's one line. They had to take out one line. It also looks like someone just accidentally hit the duplicate line of code key combination in their editor and messed everything up. And it, it's an honest mistake. It can happen, but it should have been reviewed before it went out. I'm sure... I'm sure it was probably reviewed, but it was probably reviewed by the people in the same department that, oh, I got it, I got it, I got it, we've done this a million times, and they just didn't see it. Yeah. And it, look, it was indented properly. It wasn't that it wasn't indented properly, but even my students who, I guess this is written in Objective-C, who don't know Objective-C, spotted it immediately and said, oh, uh, that that's a problem. And yeah. they went from there. And everyone's asking me, well, what does it do? And I had to explain to them what a man-in-the-middle attack was. It's good to know that it only is if you're on open Wi-Fi. That, that it right. really, really affects you. Again, it's not good to have, but it only really affects you, like you said, if you're on open Wi-Fi. Yeah, so, you know, just another reason, one more on top of the giant mountain we gave you in Episode 17, to stay away from open Wi-Fi. And that said, if you're on web and somehow, for some reason, there's a whole bunch of people using your connection, which they probably are if you're still using web security because it's you can break it in about 34 seconds. It's really easy. Um, web probably wouldn't protect you if there are other people, malicious people, using your connection and they're running a man-in-the-middle attack on you. You have to be careful with this stuff. Uh, losing SSL means that, you know, when you log into most websites, your username and your password, somebody can see that. Someone could watch the traffic fly by with Wireshark and they go, oh yeah, I've got that dude's password now. And they can log into your account without having to hack anything, without having to break anything. So run your updates. Please, it's easy. It's really easy. You don't have to change behavior. Just hit the button. It's, it's there. It's flashing. Just hit the button. And I want to remind you, if you haven't called uh, your mother recently or your grandmother recently, now is the time to give them a call, take the trip over there, update their iPad, their phone for them. Don't explain why. It's not worth it. Just say, we're making you safer. They'll, they'll be really happy that you did. Yeah. Because the other part of security, and I think we, and ma one of the main reasons for the podcast is, is just because you're secure doesn't mean that others are. And the more people, it's like a vaccination. You may get vaccinated, but you really want everyone around you. You want to prevent anything from going near you. And if everyone's updated, the hackers are not going to go after this exploit if they know that with that 80% of the people within a day updated. Right. It's just not worth their time. It's the exact same reason why early on back in the day, no one made Mac viruses. Why would you make Mac viruses? They're what? 2% of possible computer users? Why don't you make a virus that would affect 90... Why, why would you aim for the small target? Aim for the big target. Affect the most amount of people you can. So, yeah, make sure everyone else is updated. If you're in a company, talk to your IT department about this. If, if you run an IT department, draft out a letter or something, send an email... Tell people to update. It's really easy. If you've got your iPhones under management, which is cool, you can, in most management suites, you hit a button and it pushes and forces all of the iPhones to update at once. It's that easy. And if, you, if you're trying to update over the air, and I, I, I came across this problem, and you run out of space, I think, I think the iOS update is bigger than, you, than we think. Uh, what's it called? You're going to get an out-of-space error. What that means is that they have to download the whole update to your phone. You have to basically float that space. So if you can't do it, it's going to say it's going to fail. What, we, what I recommend is go home, connect it to iTunes. If you haven't done a backup recently, it's going to do a backup, with the, obviously with the issue, but it will download. Now it's on your computer, and you, and you have that for all the other devices. So if you have an iPad, an iPhone, an iPod Touch, it will do it on all of them, and all you got to do is just keep on connecting the wire. 
So just be aware of that. So if somebody says, you know what, I don't have time for this, I'll do it later, please make sure they do it later. It's very important. So. And uh, if you if you want kind of the the high level, hey, look, I'm I'm not a crypto guy. I'm not a computer nerd. I'm just some dude who's trying not to get viruses and trying not to get hacked. If you're the normal guy out there, go to gotofail.com. Look a couple links down in, in the bottom block. They said some further explanation of this site can be found in the FAQ. When you go there, uh, there's a section called Can You Explain Like I'm Five How the Bug Works? And they do they, they go through kind of the back and forth of what your computer says and what a server says back to it in that conversation. It's a really nice explanation of how this works, and it's easy to get a hold of. They're not going to use any technical terms. So it really is. I'm reading out. it now. I can I can understand it. Sometimes I think like I'm five, so if I get it, I think most <laughs> people should. And again, if again, if, if if the person doesn't want to deal with it, do whatever you can do. Take them out to dinner. Figure it out because, like you said, at the end of the day, you're trying to be protected, but you want the others so this virus doesn't doesn't propagate and other people don't have it. Because it all it takes is one bad apple on the network. You get hacked. You have identity theft. You have all this. And think about that hassle. Think yeah. about all of the people on their MacBooks working on you know very secret stuff for their company over an SSL tunnel on open airport Wi-Fi. Think about all those people. And when you tell a friend, have them tell their friends. Spread the love. And I think, and, unless and it's again, my machine... We don't want to make this... Oh, I lost you. No, you're back. Oh, I was going to say, uh, I don't want to make this... An I don't want to make this an Apple versus Android thing. We're not. We're we're saying this is a simple, obvious error that anybody can make. It's not that Apple did this on purpose, or Android's better because it's open source or whatever it is. It was a natural mistake. They we caught it right away. They said that that they fixed it. They fixed it. I mean, within hours. Oh, it was and lightning they pushed fast. It out. Wait, so. Uh, on one hand, I don't think this should have gotten through through a code review. I understand how it did, but Apple, because they heard about it, they responded quickly. They got the you know the iOS vulnerability taken care of pretty much right away, and then the Mac vulnerability a little bit later. They pushed that out and fixed it. So kudos to Apple for not sitting on this really serious security bug. They really fixed it up in an incredible amount of time. I mean, other companies, if, if you look at you know companies like Cisco, or it, there were even uh, a few early Android bugs that affected security negatively, and that took a couple days or, you know, sometimes even a week to get pushed through. So we've got to hand it to them. They did a good job. Look, when, when somebody finds out and says that they're actively trying to fix a security problem and they're really upfront about it, just like we talked about with Kickstarter last week, that's a good thing. That means you know that they actually care. If it takes a day or two, at least they're telling you, hey, this is what's going on. And, and so, we can pretty much be guaranteed that Apple's going to keep a real close eye on things here for at least a couple weeks, right? Um, so, yeah. And they shouldn't so, have this again. Well, we hope. I mean, switching gears, uh, Mobile World Congress, did you hear about the black phone? I did. I did hear about the black phone, and I'm I'm of two separate minds about the whole thing. Well, let's talk about what it is. And I know we're switching gears, but I mean that's all about. We can talk about Apple without really boring you. Mm -hmm. And Mobile World Congress came up, and uh, and Silent Circle, the people that did uh, encrypted voice, and uh, L uh, L Ladar Levinson, who did. Lava Bit, which Snowden used as his email client, teamed up together to make this this really, really trust no one cell phone that runs, a, I guess, a fork of Android. Yeah, it is. So um, what's the problem? I I, mm, I wish that we could solve this problem, but it's so fundamental to what a cell phone is. It's so fundamental of an issue that it is one of the most difficult things to fix. 
Um, at the end of the day, you are tying this device, this piece of hardware, to a cell phone provider, to a, a cell phone service provider. You're tying it to AT&T or Verizon. And these companies, yeah, unless you're doing end-to-end -end encryption on everything, which, by the way, is almost impossible to do with, you know, more than three people in your contact list, um, unless you want to teach grandma how PGP works or have her set up a, a ZRTP voice call, VoIP call stream on her phone. By the way, that's never going to happen. You're never going to convince your mother or your grandmother to do that. They don't even know what that means. Um, uh, you can still be tracked through your cell phone carrier. Your cell phone carrier could get subpoenaed. They could send off all your data. They could be capturing your data. They could be The NSA could have a box in there siphoning off all of your data, which we've seen them do before with the uh, AT&T network closets. So it's, is it a good idea? Yeah. Is it better than you know a straight you know, new Galaxy phone from AT&T? Eh, probably in some ways. Will this protect you from the NSA? No. Will it protect you from a bad cell phone company? No. Will it protect you from a hacker who actually wants to target you? Absolutely not. I mean, I Good saw idea. it and I said, this is, a, this is a great idea. And then when it came out the other day, yesterday, whatever it was, I said, uh, this is basically essential. I'm buying a $650 smartphone that's not going to have any apps because you can't use the Google Store, because you're not using any of the Google uh, frameworks. So basically, it's a phone, it's a browser, and it's encrypted text messaging to only those people who use the same program on the other side. And it feels like, if that's the case, you might as well buy a dozen burner phones, uh, what's it called, and every week or so, switch it up. You may have better luck of evading and really do everything over the phone and do PGP on on your computer. I don't see... I feel like you're buying all this and you're not going to get any enjoyment of it whatsoever. And like you said, I don't think it's going to really pr protect you from privacy. Yeah, I so... I don't see anyone buying this because it, it fundamentally fails as a smartphone for most users. Unless you are actively going out and saying, I'm going to use the Silent Circle branded apps for everyone. I'm only going to use protected Wi-Fi. I am only going to communicate through these secure channels. And I'm not going to install any other applications that talk to any other external services, being games, being other messaging clients, being Skype, even. It's... Uh, I... You know what? Uh, we've got to hand it to them. I like that someone is trying it. We have to try it so we can iterate on it. But it is nowhere near good enough. It is way too encumbered. And it really fails the convenience versus security test. I mean, this is a truly inconvenient device that needs to, that wants to be really secure. But as soon as you throw that SIM card in it, it's worthless. All of your security is for naught, or most of your security is for well, naught. I just look at it, okay, let's say they did everything right, and clearly AT&T, well, AT&T, GSM, or T-Mobile really can't get anything. Okay, like you said, they only give you three, they give you two years of silent circle uh, uh, phone calling that's encrypted, but the other person has to have it. So to combat that, they give you three invites. So now you can really only talk to three people. And you got to get other people to end up buying it. Same with the email. You might as well just use PGP on your computer. Text messaging, there are secure there are secure information. We keep on talking about Threema. So there are ways to do this that does that that still allow you basically to play Flappy Bird. And if you're really that crazy, like I said, burner phones and having your laptop with a VPN at all times is probably the way to go. Be careful with burner phones. If um, the NSA tracks uh, cell phones go coming on and off of networks, so if you make a call with a burner phone, snap the phone, throw it away, and then turn on another phone where you're standing in the same rough location, you will become a target for the NSA for an undetermined amount of time. I do remember that. So I almost feel like 
I almost feel like you're you're on their list, but the other way is that but they don't have any information other than you're on their list versus the other way they're just getting everything because like you said, it can't be all encrypted. Right. Because you're running through the middleman of being AT and T. Yeah, and AT&T can still tell, no matter how much encryption you use, if you've got a, a cell phone SIM card, if you're hooked to any cell phone service whatsoever, they can still tell what tower you're connected to. Always. So, like you said, it's a good first iteration, but I think we should work on like, uh, like an application, I don't know, pack, framework, something. Yeah, it's it's hard to do when people will install any application whatsoever. So the Flappy Bird clones that came out on Android, some of them had wide open permission sets and they would read all your contacts, they would, you know, they it gave it the ability to take screenshots or to, you know, record things. And people were installing this left and right. No issues whatsoever. You have to, if you're going to be secure, it's got to be more than just installing a text secure app. You've actually got to change your behavior some. And I mean, and and we keep on, and that's what we're trying to show you. It's the reason they need your contacts is they're trying to get you to share something on Facebook. It's not that they're going to spam everybody. I mean, they may, but for the most part, most of these are just little things. But you have to just be aware of them. Remember, mm. Path, Path wanted your contacts so they could invite your friends that they were going to scan your address book for emails that matched other users so you can quickly find them. That's a convenience, but what you're doing is you're giving Path, in our case Path, uh, your contact list, and what they did is they stored it indefinitely. And they got flack for that, and they eventually said, we're going to stop it. But it took somebody to do the, the snooping around to get it. So with permissions, you have to be careful, but... It's or you can go real tinfoil hat on the other side, pay six hundred and fifty dollars for this type of phone, and and get fake security. You'll feel safe, but your the government still can get your information. Right. So. so at the end of the day, it's open source technologies, open source encryption, and your Linux box on a piece of hardware that you verified every component in it and made sure there are no hardware-level backdoors. It's almost impossible to have a completely clean machine because you just can't verify all that. No one can. And you're running your own generator. Yeah. Because you can't use the, the, the grid. And, I mean, it's, again, security versus convenience. We're telling you update your phone with the last minute left because that's a really simple thing to do. It saves you a, a big nightmare, and yeah. it just makes sense. Going on the other side, the black phone where it is open source, but their parts, I bet you their parts are closed. Now you're trusting them also. I don't think they're open sourcing their silent circle app. Yeah, I don't believe so, but I would need to look into that. So anyway, we need to wrap up. So, yep. again, update your phone and update your parents' phone. Tell the world, tweet it out, do whatever you need to do. Get everyone who has an iOS device within the last two or three years to update. And we'll, I mean, I guess we'll Go see you next fail. week. Go to fail.com. Go to fail.com. Okay, Tom, I will see you next week. See you guys.